Hello, I'm Mia Hunt, editor of Global Government Forum, the publishing events and research business serving civil servants around the world. Welcome to our webinar on developing immunity, IT security in the era of remote working, covering new and emerging cybersecurity risks and ways to combat them. This webinar is run in association with Global Cybersecurity Provider Tripwire, and you'll hear from Paul Eden, Director, International Services at Tripwire in a moment. Before you do, I have a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, just to let you know the webinar is being recorded in part so that we can produce an article for publication on Global Government Forum. Uh, now, at the end, we've set aside a good chunk of time to answer your questions. So please do click on the Q&A box at the foot of the Zoom window and type any questions you have in there. I'll keep an eye on it and we'll get through as many as we can during the Q&A session after Paul's presentation. And if you have any further questions after the event, Tripwire will be happy to answer them. We'll email everyone with a contact when we send out the link to the recording and the write-up. That's all from me for now. Over to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Maria. So first of all, um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for attending. Uh, and I would like to start off by apologizing. Um, my laptop uh, gave up the ghost just before uh, we got into this. So Maria's kindly agreed to um, do my slides for me. So um, quick introduction, Paul Eden, as, uh, as you've been told, um, the Director for International Services at Tripwire. Uh, my background is over 20 years working for various military and government intelligence agencies, um, and the last 20 years working for commercial vendors uh, of security products. Um, I'd like to set the scene before we get going. So um, over the past six months, COVID-19 has moved from a concern to a threat and finally to a pandemic. The threat to life has forced governments to quarantine cities, districts, states, and through closing of borders, countries. This same threat has also forced organizations and individuals to take what some would describe as extreme steps. We've had to embrace new living and working practices, such as constantly sanitizing, whilst apparently singing happy birthday, social distancing, which I see as uh, a legal uh, requirement to sit in a different room to my kids. Um, but probably for most people on this call, the most impactful change has been the need for remote working. The unplanned uh, expansion of business network boundaries has compelled organizations to quickly source additional hardware, reconfigure their ask, ac um, access controls, and identify and implement new and sometimes very unfamiliar tools to provide users with um, some level of remote, uh, sorry, and, and to provide users hopefully with some level of remote training. As a consequence of these changes, many organizations feel that they've left themselves less secure and with probably a raised um, risk profile. And to make it worse and more challenging, while organizations have been busy focusing on enabling the new remote workforce, hackers and cyber criminals have been quick to capitalize on the crisis and the lack of organizational focus in areas such as cybersecurity. Can we go to the first slide, please? Um, so here's the agenda, uh, but just again, as a bit of background, between the 14th and the 21st of April this year, uh, Tripwire conducted a survey on COVID-19's impact on cybersecurity. Um, we received a response from over 340 um, security professionals employed within small, medium, and large enterprise across both North America and EMEA. Now I must point out that two thirds of the respondents were from the US and a third from EMEA, but I think the results were pretty similar, um, and I'll show you in a minute, but uh, I think it's still very relevant to the discussion we're having today. <clears throat> I'm sure no one would be surprised to know that of those respondents, 94% of 
um, felt more concerned about security now than they did pre-COVID-19. For those interested, um, I believe a copy of the survey will be provided after today's session, but feel free to go to Tripwise State of Security and you'll find a copy of Tim Erlin's report, Cybersecurity Must Be an Integral Part of Your Pandemic Response Plan, which was written using the information we gained from the survey. That said, um, I'd like to uh, discuss some of the challenges being faced by public and private sector organisations, as there seems, in all honesty, to be little difference between the challenges faced by um, both areas of business. So I'm going to cover some of the COVID-19 related attacks. Um, we'll look in a little bit more detail at the three main culprits. We'll go through um, what you should be doing to protect remote assets, um, a little bit about training and support uh, and how that should look. And then um, I'd like to have a look and see how the survey results fit with what we're actually seeing in the real world. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm gonna start with one of the interesting stats from our survey. Um, and this, I promise this is not all about the survey, but I thought this was quite interesting. So of the 345 IT security professionals surveyed, seven um, had already been breached by a COVID-19 related attack. Um, and I'm looking at the blue numbers here. I'm not splitting out North America from EMEA. Um, I don't think there's a need. Um, 210 had seen attempts, unsuccessful attempts, fortunately. And then the other 128 weren't aware or hadn't seen evidence of any attack. So how does this fit with what we're currently seeing? Well, the National Cybersecurity Centre is telling us that state-sponsored hacking um, or state-sponsored hackers are targeting healthcare, research labs and universities that are involved in national or international COVID-19 research. The main vector of those attacks seems to be um, misconfigured or unpatched VPN solutions and unpatched applications um, such as Citrix. And although the research establishments are the end goal, the attacks seem to be targeted um, at the supply chain um, as that appears to be the softer target. What they've also noticed is the need to maintain good communication across the now remote workforce has pressured individuals and organizations into installing unfamiliar communication apps in a compressed timeline. In the past three months, we've seen a huge increase in cyber criminals taking advantage of vulnerabilities and misconfiguration of applications like uh, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and Google Meets, uh, and the other general communication um, chats we use. But I have to say, they the, uh, the vendors have been quick to react, and I believe that all of the known vulnerabilities have now been mitigated with either software updates or patches. Um, however, misconfigurations may not have been, and that's, uh, that will be a major issue. On the other side of the pond, and I think this is relevant because it's, um, it's a global issue, um, the FBI are reporting approximately 192,000 COVID-19 related cyber attacks every week. And about 90% of these start as phishing email, many of them impersonating the World Health Organization, or the United Nations, or some other official organization um, working with COVID-19 uh, within the COVID-19 arena. The phishing emails obviously are attempting to trick users into clicking infected documents or links, which enable malware to be downloaded onto the user's computer. Now, the majority of malware being deployed that they can see is keyloggers and um, ransomware. Obviously, keyloggers 
to capture passwords and useful information and give them further access into systems uh, and the ransomware um, well we know we all know how that works so for the next five or ten minutes I'm going to concentrate on the three main culprits and three challenges that we need to protect our business against and that's the phishing email um, the malware that is deployed by some of the links on these phishing email and the uh, looking at virtual private networks next slide please so we'll look at phishing first so as you all probably know phishing takes three forms there is general phishing which is aimed at anyone who can be reached by the attacker we have spear phishing which is much more targeted. It's normally targeted towards a specific business or a group or even an individual. Uh, and then we have what's called whaling, uh, which is aimed at the high profile individuals within a business. So people like the board members. Although we haven't specifically seen a significant increase in phishing emails, we have seen a change of focus from the financial lures that they used to use to the COVID-19 or coronavirus lures. So emails are coming in with titles like COVID-19 daily updates, new confirmed outbreak in your town, city or area, things like that. Um, but to be honest, it's, it's kind of less about the subject and more about the results. And the main aim of the attackers, as we said, is to gain access to credentials um, usernames, passwords, etc., um, or to deploy the most common um, malwares, which, as I said earlier, were keylogs and ransomware. So, what can we be doing to protect our organisations? Well, to be honest, it's a lot of it is still the basics. So, to improve your resilience and prevent your domain from being used for spoofing you need to employ um, a multi-layered approach. So basically you're back to def um, defense in depth. Now because phishing attacks are used as the primary method for um, deploying the malware, many of the suggestions I'm gonna make here are also suggestions that will come up in the malware section. So the first thing you need to look at is how do you make it more difficult for the, the attacker to reach your users? So you need to be looking at, um, and I'm not going to go into a great deal of detail because we don't have the time today, but you need to be looking at anti-spoofing um, using protocols, different techniques, policies. Um, so things like domain-based message authentication reporting and conformance, um, better known as DMARC or domain keys identified mail, um, and there is also um, sender policy frameworks uh, that are available out there that, that should be used. You need to reduce the amount of, or try to reduce the amount of um, information useful to the hacker that you're providing on your websites. As I said, this is all kind of basic. You need to educate users about their digital footprint and how it can impact not just the business, but them personally. Use available tools to block or filter incoming phishing emails, so blacklisting, things like that. Protect, um, you need to protect yourself against undetected phishing emails, so emails that, that get passed. So you need to be looking at using solutions like malware detection, uh, configuration management, file integrity monitoring. You need to only use support, supported versions of applications and make sure that your patching is up to date. Try and make sure that only admins, where possible, um, can install applications on your systems and you make sure that your policy dictates that they never use those admin accounts to browse the web or to check on their email. Protect users from malicious websites. Most browsers um, use URL blacklisting to block malicious um, sites. 
you can use whitelisting uh, and that can be used to implicitly allow specific sites. Use proxy services um, to block attempts to reach websites that have been identified as hosting malware. A really important one is where possible to use two-factor authentication because that reduces the risk of any stolen credentials being useful um, on your network. And then always apply the policy of least privilege. And that means, um, you know, when you consider that the damage an attacker can do is directly proportionate to the privilege of the account that they access. So if your users don't have admin access, then they don't get admin rights to your systems, or it's more difficult for them to do so. Next slide, please. So we're going to look at um, malware, um, and malware covers any malicious software really that, if executed, will cause harm to your systems, operations, or reputation. The most prevalent cur currently, as we've discussed, is ransomware and keyloggers. And as you all know, ransomware um, is a specific type of malware that denies a business legitimate access to critical data by means of encryption, and a keylogger records the keystrokes on the specific device it's installed to capture um, critical information such as login credentials, personal information, or even business confidential documents. Unfortunately, there's no silver bullet that protects you from malware infection, so you should expect and plan to be infected at some point. So again, the best strategy um, is defense in depth using that multi-layered approach. So some of the key actions you should be taking to reduce your risk um, and the impact of infection are things like, you need to be making regular offline backups. Now it's not gonna prevent you getting the infection, but it's gonna aid you to quickly and cleanly recover without the need to consider paying any ransom. Um, block websites that are known to be malicious. And as we mentioned earlier, that you can use blacklisting, um, you can use whitelisting, proxy services. And if you're gonna use proxy services, I would advise any public sector organization or business to look at the NCSC protective DNS service. Actively inspect the content, your download content in particular, filtering email attachments and file downloads. You should be using central management for your enterprise devices to, mit, to um, permit only trusted apps to run. Education, good housekeeping, sound processes and strong policies are all really important. Support software versions, uh, sorry, supported software versions are critical and always, always keep them up to date with patches. Employ and maintain file integrity monitoring. This is the same stuff we discussed earlier. Vulnerability assessment, malware detection, and my favorite, antivirus, the solution that apparently should have died 10 years ago. And as I said, these are the basics. Um, they're the basics of a good security strategy, which hopefully everyone already has. Next slide, please. So virtual private networks. Okay, so with most of our employers, uh, employees now working from home, VPN services have been pushed to the forefront. So it's no surprise to find that the VPN now forms a critical part of most organizations' IT and communications backbone. <clears throat> the security, um, and by which I mean confidentiality, integrity, and availability, or CIA for anybody old enough to um, remember that term, um, must be one of the primary focuses of any IT team. A few of the things that I'd expect them to be looking at is making sure that they've scaled the VPN concentrators, the portals, and the gateways 
to cope with the additional remote connections. They need to ensure that VPN services are up to date and fully patched. And that's the same with any application, to be honest. Look at enabling multi-factor authentication to, help, uh, to protect those VPN accounts. Again, this is specifically targeted phishing attacks that deploy the key logging software. If they manage to get the password, at least if you're using multi-factor authentication, it's not going to get them to where they want to be. Employee consistent, uh, sorry, employee constant is the word I was looking for. Uh, monitoring of your VPN performance and availability. Now that the VPN is acting um, as a critical gateway into your network, it's likely that cyber criminals are going to look at targeting with things like the DDoS attack, which is going to exhaust your VPN system resources and obviously crash the servers. One thing to consider, and I wouldn't expect this to be a, a big problem, uh, I hope, in, um, in the public sector, but if employees are using personal computers because there just aren't enough uh, work laptops to go around, then you need to be looking at what their security status is, what access controls have they got, what shared, you know, what users do they share that machine with, what software are they, have they got on there, what patches are they... You know, are they up to date with patches? Basic security applications, what are they running? Um, obviously, if it's not a corporate machine, it's very difficult to control that kind of um, um, uh, system. What level of trust should they be given? Uh, this is, you know, this is a risk assessment that the business should be taking uh, based on, um, you know, what their security status is with regards to the device they're using. And what level of access should they have to organizations, files, shares, and other resources? Because at the end of the day, um, they probably don't need the same level of access as they had in the office, but they do need access. But if they're sharing that machine with four or five other people, or even two other people, do you really want them having access to some of your um, confidential information or access to critical devices. I'd strongly um, recommend that any public sector organization, again, refers to the NCSC guidance. Um, and that will give you information as to the type of VPN you should be using and the best practice configurations for that VPN. Um, and if you look at uh, the NCS guidance, you'll find that a lot of the information we're talking about um, today is covered over the last, well, it's probably been covered over the last six to eight, 12 months, but it's certainly become more um, focused over the last two or three months. Next slide, please. So I want to quickly look at uh, protecting your remote assets. So obviously from, um, from a business perspective, we're we're going to want to try and mirror the internal network security practices, processes, and applications. Being able to monitor for known vulnerabilities or configuration changes or compliance status are all critical elements of ensuring security of devices used both on the network and remotely. There aren't any real technical reasons that the same tools being used within the network providing these services um, shouldn't be able to handle the same tasks in a more distributed network environment. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. There are lots of good, valid reasons why they can't. But what we're seeing is a gap in the products that we're deploying rather than any technical barrier. And a good example of this is um, a vulnerability solution. So a vulnerability assessment, if you're using an agent-based solution, then the location of the endpoint really doesn't matter that much. However, if you're using a network-based vulnerability solution, then as the asset moves out of the network, then it becomes invisible. Um, I think a good starting point 
is to only deploy, and this is if you have control over these devices, only deploy remote hardware that has been configured using your certified gold build, if you have a certified gold build. All remote devices need to be centrally managed. So you need to manage the application, the versions, the configuration, the patching. And use solutions, again, we've talked about these before, change management to monitor for unauthorized changes on those devices, compliance management to alert you if they fall out of compliance, um, vulnerability management to identi identify any new vulnerabilities that appear on them and any patches that may be missing. And then malware detection, and again, my old friend, antivirus. Please make sure that your users understand the risks associated with unauthorized access to their work device. And by that, uh, I'm not talking about somebody else from outside getting access, I'm talking about members of their family or other members of their household. Uh, I know that some organizations have allowed um, guest access uh, that segments the, um, the guest from the main system and is purged on a schedule or when the guest logs out. Um, I don't particularly think that's a good solution, but some organizations have gone down that route. Uh, and make sure that all of your remote users are fully trained on the new applications, such as the communications uh, software that's now being used and video conferencing software, and of course the VPN. Next slide, please. So I've only got a little bit on training and support. Um, with regards to support, it's just remember it's not just about work. Make sure your mobile workforce has all the contact information they need to cover not just the technical issues they may suffer, but also administrative issues and personal challenges. If possible, um, an out of hours number should be made available for emergencies. Um, and try and organize uh, weekly and fortnightly town hall sessions. I mean, we do these ourselves within our organization every two weeks. Um, try and keep it less formal. Try to make it um, a bit more of a social event to help people um, stay connected, basically. Um, and if necessary, apply apply it to smaller groups instead of having a very large group um, split it down into smaller groups with regards to training um, most organizations use online training so it shouldn't really change that much you just need to remember that if you're deploying new applications i.e uh, a vpn they may never have used before communications and video conferencing software make sure all users receive adequate training to ensure that they're not only getting the most benefit out of the solution but they're not creating the business additional risk um, run regular updates it's no good just running the training once you know it, especially if you've got more than one application because people forget so run regular updates and refresh your sessions uh, you can do them either live or recorded. And if you're doing recorded, then you need to make sure that you include contact details for questions and issues, should they have any. Next slide, please. And uh, finally, back to our survey. So what I wanted to do is the last thing was to check out our survey and see how it reflected what we're actually seeing um, in the wild. So interestingly enough, when we asked the survey participants, what areas of your security are you more concerned about now than you were um, prior to COVID-19? 58% of the respondents um, said employee home network security. 45% said increased ransomware 
phishing and social engineering attacks. 41% um, had keeping remote systems configured securely. 38% keeping remote systems compliant and 38% securing and analyzing the traffic coming through our VPNs. So it pretty much fits in with what we're hearing from NCSC, the FBI, and other organizations with regards to uh, what we're seeing live um, in the wild. Um, next slide. So now we're gonna open up for questions. Thank you very much for that, Paul. Um, we've got about half an hour left for questions. Um, so for audience members, please do type any questions you have in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, I've got one here that I'll start off with. Um, Paul, you mentioned um, that of the IT security professionals surveyed by Tripwire, 2% that they've been breached in a COVID-19 related attack and 61% had seen unsuccessful attempts. Um, what can affected organizations learn from individual attacks and attempts and how can they use those learnings to better protect uh, their systems? So uh, I, I, I can't speak specifically to any one of those attacks, but what I, what I would say is that um, from the anecdotal evidence we have again it's down to the majority of them are um, started off with a phishing attack and it's then either the keylogger or the ransomware i mean we rans ransomware we've we've struggled with um for many years now keyloggers have been around for a long time um i think the key to this is making sure that uh you're using best practice configuration um, for any of the tools that you're using um, or applications, uh, make sure that you keep them up to date with regards to patches. And I know patches have to be tested for a certain period of time before they're deployed into the um, uh, into the production environment. That's fine, but have a process that guarantees that that's done within a within a shorter period as possible. Uh, and then it's down to education. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the user is our is is normally our weakest link, and that's not because they're, you know, weak or stupid. It's it's just human nature. Um, so, education, education, education. It's um, it's key to make sure that not only do you run these education sessions, but you make them interactive, and you make them kind of fun. Because if it's boring, they've forgotten five minutes after they've completed it. You know, running um, a 30 minute session where they have to watch a video, answer five questions right, and then move on to the next video, it might give them the information they need, but they're unlikely to absorb it for, for more than the time it takes them to get through that. And it's a bit like a tick box scenario. Um, so the more you can do, uh, you know, some wargaming uh, with email. Uh, what, what our company does is we're not regularly, but we randomly receive uh, phishing emails and we report them or we don't report them. If you open them up, then they will let you know that you missed it and they will, you know, uh, talk to you or they will try and educate you further. Um, and if you get it, then it, great, it's kind of announced 80%, 85%, whatever it is, uh, successfully identified, you know, the last uh, phishing email. Uh, and it is, it's, it's about telling them when they're successful. It's not about punishing people for their mistakes, not in, not in this kind of environment. Yeah, okay. And um, on that education piece and on phishing emails, um, you know, some of them are very convincing. And you mentioned that more and more now they're coming from, um, from very well-known or appear to come from very well-known organizations. Um, how can employees determine which are legitimate emails and which are malicious ones? 
um, you know, what are the telltale signs that they can look up, out for and how do you um, get that across in, uh, in training sessions? So there's, there's a few things. Um, when you're looking at the email, Uh, as you said, they are becoming much better at putting these templates together, uh, but they are normally templates. So you're looking for things like um, urgency. If they're trying to enforce urgency so that you take an action quickly, and, I, and by that I mean things like if you don't re if you don't act in the next so many minutes, then you've lost the opportunity, or um, making you feel under pressure by suggesting that it um it may have consequences for your health things like that then that's quite worrying because that's not what you'd normally get from a, a legitimate organization you'd get helpful advice you wouldn't get you know the threat of uh of um illness or something like that the other thing is they're going to have they're going to have links they're going to try and link you to a website or they're going to ask you to open a document um, and with most browsers if you drift over the top of those links it will give you the true address um, you need to oh, I think you're muted there Paul Um, they're spoofing the actual. Uh, Sorry, Paul, I think we missed a, a short section there. Sorry. Um, so, uh, if you hire, if you drift over the top of the the link, it will give you the true address. And what I'm saying is, they're getting much cleverer now. They're actually registering URLs um, with COVID nineteen or coronavirus in the title, or they're spoofing the actual um, legitimate organization that they're, uh, they're saying to represent. But if you look at, more often than not, if you look at the address, it may look valid, but if you look at it carefully, you'll see that there are slight differences. They may have put a one in instead of an I, they may have an underscore to split a word that um, isn't in the legitimate. And if, you're, if you are concerned, go to the legitimate site. Don't use the link. Uh, and that's the, to be honest, that's the best advice I can give to users. Thank you. Um, and sort of following on from that as well, you mentioned um, the survey results at the end there that one of the biggest concerns is um, people now working from home. Um, and as part of that, people are having to rely on communication tools. Um, and there are sort of risks and concerns around those, particularly if people are dealing with sensitive information. Um, how can these tools and platforms be used as securely as possible before robust, more robust options um, and software updates become available? Okay, so um, as I said, most of the most of those um, solutions have made changes recently and they've released patches, but that still doesn't um, prevent uh, access. So what's some of the things that have been happening is people have been having uh, company meetings. Um, and they're actually getting people outside the company attending those meetings because they've managed to uh, get into the system. So things that they need to be looking at is when, when you, it's one of the reasons why I said try and reduce the size of you know, your weekly or two weekly meetings because it makes it much easier to manage. If you know who's going to be there, then um, it's easier for you to monitor who's on the phone call uh, or who's on the uh, video conference. Um, patching, as we said, patching is really important. Make sure you're up to date with patches. Uh, make sure it's corporate. It's supported by the corporate. One of the things we've seen is lots of people using the same solution that they use in their private life because it's available. They know how it works. Um, but it's not uh, approved by the business. Um, and that's why I said central management of those devices is key because you need to make sure that, then, that users are not able to download a piece of software because they've used it before, but that it's a centrally managed piece of software by the, by the business. 
And that way they can do best practice configuration and make sure that they are as safe as possible when using those solutions. Yeah. Okay. Um, and going back to your point about unauthorized access as well, um, it, does the increased cybersecurity threat provide a natural cap on, on remote working by making it impossible for civil servants in certain fields, such as those handling uh, sensitive data, to work from home or can robust systems be built to protect that kind of information? So there, there are robust, secure um, networks that are virtual private networks that can be used by government. Um, normally, they don't allow the majority of users to uh, access uh, restricted or confidential information. But in this time, uh, I guess you have to in some cases. And when doing that, you just have to make sure that you are using a known, trusted, virtual private network. Um, um, where necessary, uh, you are encrypting, even though it's an encrypted connection, uh, you can still send encrypted files across. But it's, it's again, it's, it's basics. It's making sure that um, you're only giving access to the information that is absolutely necessary for that person to do their job. You are monitoring that access to make sure that they are working within their normal remit so you know if they're accessing it at three o'clock in the morning that's very unlikely to be the person um, that you're expecting to be on that connection uh, and make sure that where possible you're always using encryption and that includes the virtual private network connections mm -hmm. see on that point we had a question in from um, from someone watching uh, on VPNs um, someone that wants to, uh, to know um, how to secure and patch those networks. Um, so more of a technical question, but if you could tell us a little bit more about that, that would be great. So um, I, I'm, not, I'm not a technical guru on, on VPNs as much as I'd like to be. Um, but what I would suggest is if they go to the NCSC uh, website, um, they have provided a lot of good information around the use of VPNs, uh, which be, what type of VPN should be used in which situations, um, and the best practice configuration for those VPNs. Yeah. Um, so unfortunately, no, I can't, I, I can't tell them exactly how they do it. And to be honest, you would need to know more about the environment that they're working in, you know, whether it's um, a classified environment, non-classified, uh, what, you know what business area they're working in and more about the network to be honest yeah okay um and going back to um to COVID-19 you mentioned uh, near the beginning of your presentation there supply chains um and the risk of disrupting those now obviously that could be devastating at any time but particularly um during a, a pandemic like this um what particular risks are there around um cyber criminals focusing on attacking supply chains um, and how can government IT teams protect against those? So what we're, what we're seeing is not so much an attack on the supply chain itself, but it's, it's um, using the supply chain as a staging post to then get into either, and I was talking specifically about the NHS, uh, universities and other research establishments. So what they're doing there is they're finding it easier to get through the security that's provided on most supply chains, um, which then enables them more opportunity to connect and get access to the NHS or the university or the research lab. So it's, a, it's more about ensuring that the supply chains you're using are, have the correct level of security applied to their environments. And again, they're gonna be, you know, they're gonna be working from home, a lot of the supply chain. So, you know, it's no good having a policy um, or a, an agreement with a, a third party supplier that, you know, relies on their network security if two thirds of their employees are no longer on the network. 
they're outside the network. So, you know, risk assessments that were previously um, passed may well need to be revisited. Um, but it's going to be a struggle for for everyone involved because you you know you're trying to secure your own environment, your own extended environment. They're trying to um, secure their extended environment. Uh, but I think working together, uh, helping each other understand what the challenges and what the threats are, um, can only be for the good of uh, the environment. And again, I can't stress enough the NCSC website has a huge amount of information that helps um, both public and private sector organizations to um, to defend themselves in this in this current period mm -hmm. okay um, and this may be a question that could be um, answered by that organization as well but I just wondered um, the majority of attacks are committed by fairly low-level um, cyber criminals, um, but there's an increasing threat from state actors. Um, how can government departments best protect themselves from foreign interference? Uh, that's a difficult question because yeah, we've been trying to do that for a long time. Yeah. Um, the difference, you know, the difference between state actors and uh, cyber criminals and general hackers. Uh, is twofold. One is target and the second is finance. So, you know, a state, uh, a state supported or state sponsored attack, um, they are likely to have access to uh, a lot of data that's been collected over a, a long period of time. Uh, they're in, you know, they're not in a particular hurry. Um, they will they will go slowly, slowly to make sure that they're not easily identified. And they've had a lot of uh, very good training. Um, so protecting, again, you're back to the basics. It is, uh, unfortunately, there, there are no silver bullets. Um, it's utilizing the tools that you have uh, available and making sure that you're not just paying lip service um, and you know just glancing through the logs from a lot of these solutions you're actually feeding those logs into maybe a, a, a sim device that is then correlating the information and giving you a better picture of what's going on in your organization now that said um, a lot of these tools or like i said previously there should be no problem utilizing those with remote users but we know that there are problems because they they were never um, designed with that in mind. A lot of solutions are network based, and once you remove devices and put them outside the network, those devices become invisible, so they're more difficult to um, to monitor and manage. But that's the only way um, that you're going to protect yourself against not just state-sponsored attacks, but any attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you recommend that governments um, collaborate and share information um, together, both between themselves and um, between governments and the, the private sector? Um, you know, can that help to, present, mm -hmm. to prevent cyber attacks? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, collaboration is going to build stronger environments. You just need to make sure you're collaborating with the right people um, because I, I seem to remember reading a, an article quite recently about an organization that was all about assisting um, business to be more secure um, only for um, the authorities to discover that they were selling a lot of the information they were getting from business uh, onto the black onto the dark web so you have to do your due diligence um, but when it comes at the government level Absolutely, um, you know you've you've got very good relationships um, across most of Europe with the U.S., Canada, Australia, New Zealand, um, and probably with a lot of the Asia Pac um, countries as well. We all need to be working together to fight this. Um, you know, one of the things one of the things I always say when I do um, conferences is, you know, put your hand up 
all those people who wake up in the morning thinking fantastic another day you know another day in the office or another day at work not many people put their hands up but the people that we're up against do they love you know they they're quite happy to work 38 hours you know straight um because they find it exciting it's um it's a different um a completely different culture uh you know we do this as a job we enjoy it and we do our best but at the end of the day we have other commitments in our life they tend to be committed to this one job this one thing um you know which gives them an advantage so the more people you can get working together um the more people collaborating the stronger um our defenses should be yeah okay and uh, sort of talking about um about hackers there is there merit in governments employing ethical hackers or offering bug bounties to assess the security of their computer systems sorry you broke up there can you repeat that one yeah sure is there merit in governments employing ethical hackers or offering bug bounties to assess the security of computer systems um i personally think there's merit to it um i'm i would be surprised if um apart from you know obviously the some of the uh, the higher security um networks i would be surprised if government organizations aren't using ethical hackers um to assist them to identify i mean if you're if you're employing penetration testing which you should be as a part of your um you know your annual uh, assessments and risk assessments then you know they are pretty much ethical hackers uh they may not you know they may not class themselves as hackers but that's what they're doing they're attempting to hack into your system uh, but they're being ethical about it so you know it's difficult to draw that line uh, but i i definitely think we should be using all the skill sets that are available to us obviously again background checks do your homework you know um if that person's been around for many years and has worked for lots of organizations check with those organizations how he's performed or how they've performed if it's an organization um and make a decision but yes if if those skills are available to you um and it's a trusted resource then why not yeah and mentioned skills there how about skills um within government it teams or organization it teams as they stand um how can those skills be uh, and those capabilities be boosted um to better protect against cyber attacks um and to make sure the um the infrastructure is more robust uh, going forward so this is a challenge for um public sector <clears throat> because um unfortunately um uh, and this may not be politically correct but unfortunately public sector salaries do not match up to private sector salaries so if you've got somebody who's looking for a, a role they have the right skill sets um then the chances are they're going to get a better deal staying in the private sector which is not good for the public sector um pub, people in the public sector are normally committed to the public sector they in you know they enjoy the lifestyle the culture and that's great uh, but unfortunately a lot of them are drawn out of that environment to work in the private sector um so for me the ideal solution here is for the private uh, for the public sector to utilize the private sector so if you don't have the resources you don't have the skill sets then you know look around find a third party private sector organization that can help because you know it may be an additional cost but in the long run it's going to um be highly valuable to your business um with regards to reducing risk reducing um uh cost i mean if you if you get if you get breached Uh, and it's proved to be because of negligence then there are massive fines involved and nobody wants to go down that road so again if you have the resources available whether they're your resources or a third party providing them some form of 
um, managed service, then if you can do that, do that. Yeah. All right. Great. I think we've just about got time for a couple more questions. Um, so, it, I mean, we know that an awful lot of work has been done since um, the outbreak began um, and cyber attacks um, began to, uh, to increase um, on shoring up IT systems. Um, and a lot of that work has had to be done very, very quickly. Um, how can um, the work that's been done so far be built on um, to, to minimise the risks as working practices change, um, as we expect they might, um, and perhaps as remote working becomes more common? So, so I, I, I don't believe it's, a, it's in question anymore. I think... Um, more people will be working at home for, well, I, I can't see, you know, everyone going back to the office job. Um, I think for two reasons, the, the health reason is one, but also I think organisations that previously were concerned about, you know, managing people remotely or making sure that they're getting um, the correct level of work out of people that they don't have direct control over I think a lot of that has gone people have now realized that you know they can work remotely and responsibly um, and they can deliver uh, a good level of, of work just as good as they can in an office and in some cases better so I think people will a lot more people will stay remote what organizations need to do now is consolidate so they need to um, look at what they now have that is no longer within their network boundary. They need to decide um, on exactly what solutions they're gonna put in place or what solutions they've put in place already, but need to be um, configured correctly. Because a lot of it is down to misconfiguration. Um, and you, you get that when you, you know, when you get a new solution that you've never used before, you've got to learn quickly, deploy it quickly, there's gonna be mistakes. So they now have to go back and do that um, due diligence, they need to go back and look at the configuration. And again, I, I'm, I'm going to mention them again, NCSC. They have a lot of information on there on best practice configurations for different solutions. Um, and even if they don't cover the solution you've got, they will cover something similar and they will give you the information or a template of information that you can use. Um, but it is a case of you know, consolidating the solutions to make sure that as many as possible are the same solution that they were already using internally. Um, and then making sure that they are configured and that configuration is maintained. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and one more question then I think before we finish, can just about squeeze it in. Um, do you think then that, um, that governments, you know, they've been forced to adopt um, perhaps more sophisticated protective tools um, recently? Do you think that they're going to be better shielded from future attacks or could a lack of focus on cybersecurity once the immediate threat is over um, mean that any progress is perhaps lost? Uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't think, so I think organisations may have identified some new solutions which they uh, are found very useful and they decide to continue with and that's and that's good i don't think government was particularly any more weak in cyber security than private sector um you know they you have good and bad in both um so i've lost my train of thought for a second there um so i th i think that there may be some improvement. Uh, I don't think it, it will be because the government departments weren't doing the right thing in the first place. I think this has just given them an opportunity to identify some other options, maybe. Um, and it may well have provided them with some necessary budget that wasn't available previously. Uh, I think you're right, focus was lost on the cybersecurity side. In, you know, in the haste to get um, devices and software deployed. But from our survey, majority of the security professionals understand that that's what's happened and are working very hard 
to make sure that they backfill. Um, and nobody wants to have bolt-ons. So I think, you know, none of these solutions should be looked at as a bolt-on. It either becomes a part of your, uh, strate your strategy or it's removed and you put something else in, in its place that does a better job. Okay, thank you very much for that. Uh, we're out of time. Um, so again, thank you to you, Paul, and to Tripwire. Um, and particularly thank you to the audience. We really hope that you found it useful. Um, we'll be emailing you with a link to the slides, the recording and the write-up. Um, and meanwhile, thank you to all the civil servants watching um, for all the work you're doing to support the, the public and deliver public services at this very strange and, and difficult time. Thank you.